I know what a lot of you are thinking. Tyson looks a lot different than I remember. <laughs> but for those of us that know Tyson, we know you cannot contain that man's enthusiasm and passion for cannabis into a 10-minute speech. And so here I am, honored to be here in his stead. We've got a lot of history to get through. Let's jump right in. Like many of my peers, I was raised with a very singular view of cannabis. That cannabis was dangerous, a drug that would make you stupid, drop out of school, and become a loser. A gateway drug that would lead to harder, heavier drugs. Uh, however, throughout all of human history, cannabis has only been illegal for less than 1% of the time. 1%. At Oregon's finest, we foster a culture and an environment that helps destigmatize cannabis for our employees, for our customers. Cannabis was growing prior to human existence, and it will probably continue to grow long after we're gone. If we were to imagine that metaphorical garden of Eden, you better believe there was some of that sticky icky in there. And perhaps it wasn't an apple that gave Adam and Eve their knowledge, but some of that good, good. So if cannabis has only been illegal for less than 1% of its use, what has it been doing all this time? Well, it starts about 6,000 years before the Common Era, when cannabis seeds and oils were used in China for food. Cannabis was used to make textiles and noted to have healing properties. Cannabis is mentioned in almost every major sacred text, being it in one of Hindu's seven sacred herbs, or listed as a, by the Zoroastrians as one of the good narcotics. Cannabis makes its way to Greece and to Rome, Africa. Spaniards bring cannabis to the New World, inducing it to Chile. Angolian slaves brought cannabis with them to sugar plantations, allowing them to plant it between their crops of sugarcane. By the turn of the 19th century, Napoleon takes a team of scientists and they invade Egypt. Now, not only did they discover the key to deciphering ancient texts in the Rosetta Stone, but they also found that good, good. <laughs> They bring it back to France. Now, everyone's pretty excited about this, except, you know, Napoleon himself, who introduces the first formal penalty in recorded history for cannabis. Now, maybe the little guy was just mad that the plants were slightly taller than was. <laughs> now, cannabis makes its way into America as well. And by the 1850s, cannabis had entrenched itself in American life. In fact, it was listed in the U.S. Pharmacopoeia a public standards of uh, setting authority for all prescription and over-the-counter medications. It listed cannabis as a treatment for numerous afflictions. Cannabis in America became so en vogue that hash parlors began popping up all over the country. In fact, in 1853, hash parlors were so banging that in New York City there were said to be over 500 of these dens alone. In 1889, an article in The Lancet outlines the use of cannabis for opium withdrawals. 128 years ago, we knew cannabis could help with opium addiction, and yet today we still have people dying on the streets from heroin. Now we get into a little bit of the more modern times, and in the early 1900s, the U.S. saw a large influx of immigrants from Mexico after the Mexican Revolution. These new Americans brought with them their language, culture, and customs such as the use of cannabis as a medicine and a relaxant, which wasn't necessarily new to Americans at the time. But what was new was the way these new immigrants used cannabis. They smoked it. Smoking Mexican immigrants sometimes referred to as a cannabis plant as marijuana. This is when we begin to see a paradigm shift with how we view cannabis. See, we were already familiar with the term cannabis because it showed up so frequently in our medicine cabinet. However, the term marijuana was foreign. So, unsurprisingly, when the media began preying on fears that the public had about these new immigrants, they started spreading propaganda about this marijuana, claiming that disruptive Mexicans, with their dangerous behaviors, were destroying the good moral fabric of society. Sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> In 1914, the Harrison Act in the U.S. defined the use of marijuana as a crime. Within the next few years, the U.S. begins to prohibit cannabis for non-medical use, beginning with California, Texas, Louisiana, New York. In 1936, reefer madness is made to scare those youth away from the dangerous, dangerous drug. Despite this, however, during World War II, imports of hemp and other materials, crucial for producing marine cordage, parachutes, and other military necessities, became scarce. 
In response, the U.S. Department of Agriculture launched a Hemp for Victory program. This encouraged farmers to plant hemp by giving out seeds and draft deferments to those who would stay home and grow hemp. By 1943, American farmers harvested over 375,000 acres of hemp. Grow hemp for your country. It's the American thing to do. Despite this, in the 1950s, some of the most detrimental pieces of legislation, the Boggs Act and the Narcotics Control Act, established mandatory minimum sentences for drug-related crimes, including marijuana. A first cannabis-related offense carried a minimum sentence of two to 10 years, minimum, with up to $20,000. There's some light, the 60s happen, and a more lenient attitude towards cannabis spreads throughout the cultural climate. In 1970, the nonprofit Normal, or the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, is formed. By 72, the bipartisan Schaefer Commission, appointed by Nixon, considered laws regarding cannabis and determined that personal use of the drug should be decriminalized. Nixon rejected this recommendation, however, and instead formed the DEA and used cannabis as a tool to disenfranchise voters who disagreed with his platforms primarily hippies and African-Americans. Despite Nixon's best efforts, however, in 1974, High Times is founded. And throughout the 70s, 11 states decriminalized cannabis, and most others reduced their penalty. And can we all guess which state was leading the charge in decriminalizing cannabis? That's right, Oregon, 1973. We are the first state to decriminalize cannabis. We should be proud of it. The 80s brought with us the advent of the internet. And with that, people had a brand new cross-cultural platform through which they could safely discuss the plant, its growing needs and different methods, uses. However, by 1986, mandatory minimums of the 50s had mostly died off. So President Reagan saw fit to sign the Anti-Drug Abuse Act, reinstituting mandatory sentences for drug-related crimes. Possession of 100 cannabis plants received the same penalty as possession of 100 grams of heroin. A later amendment under Bill Clinton established the Three Strikes Rule, requiring life sentences for repeat drug offenders and using the death penalty for drug kingpins. In 89, Bush Sr. reinstates Nixon's idea of a war on drugs and gets the CIA, CIA and military involved with drug prohibition rules funneling massive amounts of taxpayer dollars in the effort of the war on drugs. Despite the, all of this, however, in 1996, our great neighbors to the South, California, love them or hate them, legalized cannabis for medical use. They weren't the first. More and more states were the first, but they weren't the last, however. More and more states began to follow suit, and today more than half of our country has legalized medical cannabis in one form or another. And more and more Americans are beginning to realize that cannabis isn't as dangerous as they told us it was. And as we all begin to see how powerful and useful this plant truly is, surely the ignorant strongholds of the last few decades will crumble and fall. When we think about cannabis, let's not obsess about the 1% of the time it has been illegal, but instead remember that 8,000 years ago, our ancestors lived harmoniously with this beautiful plant. And as we, as humanity, continue to evolve, let cannabis evolve with us. Let us continue this evolution in finding new and creative ways to introduce cannabis into our day-to-day -day lives, and let's end this awful stigma forever. Thank you very much.